Hello, welcome to the Short Story Workshop. My name is Matt Bowles. I'm here with Melody Bowles and Simone King. Today we are going to be discussing character flaws and we're going to do that by looking at The Three Sisters by Jane Austen as an example. So Mel, you picked the topic and the story, so please introduce us. Okay, so this is a story Jane Austen wrote when she was 17. It's a very cynical story about a lady who's getting married to somebody she is not very fond of. <laughs> and I chose the topic because she and both her sisters are not the nicest to each other and their flaws are what makes the story tick and makes it interesting. Perfect. All right, here is The Three Sisters by Jane Austen. My dear Fanny, I am the happiest creature in the world, for I have received an offer of marriage from Mr. Watts. It is the first I have ever had, and I hardly know how to value it enough. How I will triumph over the dozens. I do not intend to accept it, at least I believe not. But as I am not quite certain, I gave him an equivocal answer and left him. And now, my dear Fanny, I want your advice whether I should accept his offer or not, but that you may be able to judge of his merits and the situation of affairs, I will give you an account of them. He is quite an old man, about two and thirty, very plain, so plain that I cannot bear to look at him. He is extremely disagreeable, and I hate him more than anybody else in the world. He has a large fortune, and will make great settlements on me, but then he is very healthy. In short, I do not know what to do. If I refuse him, he as good as told me that he should offer himself to Sophia, and if she refused him, to Georgiana, and I could not bear to have either of them married before me. If I accept him, I know I shall be miserable all the rest of my life, for he is very ill-tempered and peevish, extremely jealous and so stingy that there is no living in the house with him. He told me he should mention the affair to Mamma, but I insisted upon it that he did not, for very likely she would make me marry him whether I would or no. However, probably he has before now, for he never does anything he is desired to do. I believe I shall have him. It will be such a triumph to be married before Sophie, Georgiana and the Duttons, and he promised to have a new carriage on the occasion, but we almost quarrelled about the colour, for I insisted upon its being blue spotted with silver, and he declared it should be a plain chocolate, and to provoke me more, said it should be just as low as his old one. I won't have him, I declare. He said he should come again tomorrow and take my final answer, so I believe I must get him while I can. I know the Duttons will envy me, and I shall be able to chaperone Sophie and Georgiana to all the winter balls, but then what will be the use of that when very likely he won't let me go myself, for I know he hates dancing, and what he hates himself he has no idea of any other person's liking, and besides, he talks a great deal of women's always staying at home and such stuff. I believe I shan't have him. I would refuse him at once if I were certain that neither of my sisters would accept him, and that if they did not, he would not offer to the Dussons. I cannot run such a risk, so if he will promise to have the carriage ordered as I like, I will have him. If not, he may ride in by himself for me. I hope you like my determination. I can think of nothing better. And am your ever affectionate, Mary Stanhope. Dear Fanny, I had but just sealed my last letter to you when my mother came up and told me she wanted to speak to me on a very particular subject. Ah, I know what you mean, said I. That old fool, Mr. Watts, has told you all about it, though I bid him not. However, you shan't force me to have him if I don't like it. I am not going to force you, child, but I only want to know what your resolution is with regards to his proposals, and to insist upon your making up your mind one way or to other, that if you don't accept him, Sophie may. Indeed, replied I hastily, Sophie need not trouble herself, for I shall certainly marry him myself. If that is your resolution, said my mother, why should you be afraid of my forcing your inclinations? Why, because I have not settled whether I shall have him or not. You are the strangest girl in the world, Mary. What you say one moment, you unsay the next. Do tell me once for all whether you intend to marry Mr. Watts or not. <laughs> Mamma, how can I tell you what I don't know myself? Then I desire you will know, and quickly too, for Mr. Watts says he won't be kept in suspense. That depends upon me. No, it does not, for if you do not give him your final answer tomorrow when he drinks tea with us, he intends to pay his addresses to Sophie. Then I shall tell all the world that he behaved very ill to me. 
What good will that do? Mr. Watts has been too long abused by all the world to mind it now. I wish I had a father or a brother, because then they should fight him. It would be cunning if they did. Mr. Watts would run away first, and therefore you must, and shall resolve, either to accept or refuse him before tomorrow evening. But why, if I don't have him, must he offer to my sisters? Why? Because he wishes to be allied to the family, and because they are as pretty as you are. But will Sophie marry him, Mamma, if he offers to her? Most likely. Why should not she? If, however, she does not choose it, then Georgiana must, for I am determined not to let such an opportunity escape of settling one of my daughters so advantageously. So make the most of your time. I leave you to settle the matter with yourself. And then she went away. The only thing I can think of, my dear Fanny, is to ask Sophie and Georgiana whether they would have him, were he to make proposals to them. And if they say they would not, I am resolved to refuse him too, for I hate him more than you can imagine. As for the Duttons, if he marries one of them, I shall still have the triumph of having refused him first. So adieu, my dear friend. Yours ever, Mary Stanhope. My dear Anne, Sophie and I have just been practising little deceit on our elder sister to which we are not perfectly reconciled, and yet the circumstances were such that if anything will excuse it, they must. Our neighbour, Mr. Watts, has made proposals to Mary, proposals which she knew not how to receive, for though she has a particular dislike to him, in which she is not singular, yet she would willingly marry him sooner than risk his offering to Sophie or me, which, in case of a refusal from herself, he told her he should do. For you must know the poor girl considers our marrying before her as one of the greatest misfortunes that could possibly befall her, and to prevent it would willingly ensure herself everlasting misery by a marriage with Mr. Watts. An hour ago she came to us to sound our inclinations respecting the affair, which were to determine hers. A little before she came, my mother had given us an account of it, telling us that she certainly would not let him go farther than our own family for a wife. And therefore, said she, if Mary won't have him, Sophie must, and if Sophie won't, Georgiana shall. Poor Georgiana, we neither of us attempted to alter my mother's resolution, which I am sorry to say is generally more strictly kept than rationally formed. As soon as she was gone, however, I broke silence to assure Sophie that if Mary should refuse Mr. Watts, I should not expect her to sacrifice her happiness by becoming his wife from a motive of generosity to me, which I was afraid her good nature and sisterly affection might induce her to do. Let us flatter ourselves, replied she, that Mary will not refuse him. Yet how can I hope that my sister may accept a man who cannot make her happy? He cannot, it is true, but his fortune, his name, his house, his carriage will, and I have no doubt but that Mary will marry him. Indeed, why should she not? He is not more than two and thirty, a very proper age for a man to marry at. He is rather plain, to be sure, but then what is beauty in a man? If he has but a genteel figure and a sensible-looking face, it is quite sufficient. This is all very true, Georgiana, but Mr. Watson's figure is unfortunately extremely vulgar and his countenance is very heavy. And then, as to his temper, it has been reckoned bad, but may not the world be deceived in their judgment of it. There is an open frankness in his disposition which becomes a man. They say he is stingy. We'll call that prudence. They say he is suspicious. That proceeds from a warmth of heart, always excusable in youth. And in short, I see no reason why he should not make a very good husband, or why Mary should not be very happy with him. Sophie laughed. I continued. However, whether Mary accepts him or not, I am resolved. My determination is made. I never would marry Mr. Watts, were beggary the only alternative, so deficient in every respect, hideous in his person, and without one good quality to make amends for it. His fortune, to be sure, is good, yet not so very large. Three thousand a year. What is three thousand a year? It is but six times as much as my mother's income. It will not tempt me. <laughs> yes, it will be a noble fortune for Mary, said Sophie, laughing again. For Mary, yes, indeed, it will give me pleasure to see her in such affluence. Then I ran on, to the great entertainment of my sister, till Mary came into the room, to appearance in great agitation. She sat down. We made room for her at the fire. She seemed at a loss how to begin, and at last said in some confusion, Pray, Sophie, have you any mind to be married? To be married? None in the least. But why do you ask me? Are you acquainted with anyone who means to make me proposals? I know, how should I? But mayn't I ask a common question? Not a very common one, Mary, surely, said I. She paused, and after some moments' silence went on. How should you like to marry Mr. Watts, Sophie? 
I winked at Sophie and replied for her, Who is there but must rejoice to marry a man of three thousand a year? Very true, she replied. That's very true. So you would have him if you would offer, Georgiana. And would you, Sophie? Sophie did not like the idea of telling a lie and deceiving her sister. She prevented the first and saved half her conscience by equivocation. I should certainly act just as Georgiana would do. Well then, said Mary, with triumph in her eyes, I have had an offer from Mr. Watts. We were, of course, very much surprised. Oh, do not accept him, said I, and then perhaps he may have me. In short, my scheme took, and Mary is resolved to do that to prevent our supposed happiness, which she would not have done to ensure it in reality. Yet, after all, my heart cannot acquit me, and Sophie is even more scrupulous. Quiet our minds, my dear Anne, by writing and telling us you approve our conduct. Consider it well over. Mary will have real pleasure in being a married woman, and able to chaperone us, which she certainly shall do. I think myself bound to contribute as much as possible to her happiness in a state I have made her choose. They will probably have a new carriage, which will be paradise to her, and if we can prevail on Mr. W. to set up his phaeton, she will be too happy. These things, however, would be no consolation to Sophie or me for domestic misery. Remember all this, and do not condemn us. Friday. Last night, Mr. Watts, by appointment, drunk tea with us. As soon as his carriage stopped at the door, Mary went to the window. Would you believe it, Sophie? said she. The old fool wants to have his new chase just the colour of the old one, and hung as low, too. But it shan't. I will carry my point. If he won't let it be as high as the Duttons, and blue spotted with silver, I won't have him. Yes, I will, too. Here he comes. I know he'll be rude. I know he'll be ill-tempered and won't say one civil thing to me, nor behave at all like a lover. She then sat down, and Mr. Watts entered. Ladies, you're most obedient. We paid our compliments, and he seated himself. Fine weather, ladies. Then turning to Mary. Well, Miss Stanhope, I hope you have at last settled the matter in your own mind, and will be so good as to let me know whether you will condescend to marry me or not. I think, sir, said Mary, you might have asked in a genteeler way than that. I do not know whether I shall have you if you behave so odd. Mary, said my mother. Well, mamma, if you will be so cross. Hush, hush, Mary, you shall not be rude to Mr. Watts. Pray, madam, do not lay any restraint on Miss Stanhope by obliging her to be civil. If she does not choose to accept my hand, I can offer it elsewhere, for as I am by no means guided by a particular preference to you above your sister's, it is equally the same to me which I marry of the three. Was there ever such a wretch? Sophie reddened with anger, and I felt so spiteful. Well then, said Mary in a peevish accent, I will have you if I must. I should have thought, Miss Stanhope, that when such settlements are offered, as I have offered to you, there can be no great violence done to the inclinations in accepting of them. Mary mumbled out something, which I, who sat close to her, should just distinguish to be. What's the use of a great jointure if men live forever? And then audibly. Remember the pin money, two hundred a year. A hundred and seventy-five, madam. Two hundred indeed, sir, said my mother. And remember, I am to have a new carriage hung as high as the Duttons, and blue spotted with silver, and I shall expect a new saddle horse, a suit of fine lace, and an infinite number of the most valuable jewels, diamonds such as were never seen, and pearls, rubies, emeralds, and beads out of number. You must set up your face on, which must be cream-coloured, with a wreath of silver flowers round it. You must buy four of the finest bays in the kingdom, and you must drive me in it every day. This is not all. You must entirely new furnish your house after my taste. You must hire two more footmen to attend me, two women to wait on me, must always let me do just as I please, and make a very good husband. Here she stopped, I believe, rather out of breath. This is all very reasonable, Mr. Watts, for my daughter to expect. And it is very reasonable, Mrs. Stanhope, that your daughter should be disappointed. He was going on, but Mary interrupted him. You must build me an elegant greenhouse and stock it with plants. You must let me spend every winter in Bath, every spring in town, every summer in taking some tour, and every autumn at a watering place. And if we are at home the rest of the year, Sophie and I laughed, you must do nothing but give balls and masquerades. You must build a room on purpose and a theatre to act plays in. The first play we shall have is Which is the Man? And I will do Lady Bell Bloomer. And pray, Miss Stanhope, said Mr. Watts, what am I to expect from you in return for all this? 
Expect? Why, you may expect to have me pleased. It would be odd if I did not. Your expectations, madam, are too high for me, and I must apply to Miss Sophie, who perhaps may not have raised hers so much. You are mistaken, sir, in supposing so, said Sophie, for though they may not be exactly in the same line, yet my expectations are, to the full, as high as my sister's, for I expect my husband to be good-tempered and cheerful, to consult my happiness in all his actions, and to love me with constancy and sincerity. Mr. Watts stared. These are very odd ideas. Truly, young lady, you had better discard them before you marry, or you will be obliged to do it afterwards. My mother, in the meantime, was lecturing Mary, who was sensible that she had gone too far, and when Mr. Watts was just turning towards me, in order, I believe, to address me, she spoke to him in a voice half humble, half sulky. You are mistaken, Mr. Watts, if you think I was in earnest when I said I expected so much. However, I must have a new chaise. Yes, sir, you must allow that Mary has a right to expect that. Mrs. Stanhope, I mean, and have always meant to have a new one on my marriage, but it shall be the colour of my present one. I think, Mr. Watts, you should pay my girl the compliment of consulting her taste on such matters. Mr. Watts would not agree to this, and for some time insisted upon its being a chocolate colour, while Mary was as eager for having it blue with silver spots. At length, however, Sophie proposed that to please Mr. W. it should be a dark brown, and to please Mary it should be hung rather high and have a silver border. This was at length agreed to, though reluctantly on both sides, as each had intended to carry their point entire. We then proceeded to other matters, and it was settled that they should be married as soon as the writings could be completed. Mary was very eager for a special licence, and Mr. Watts talked of bands. A common licence was at last agreed on. Mary is to have all the family jewels, which are very inconsiderable, I believe, and Mr. W. promised to buy her a saddle horse, but in return she is not to expect to go to town or any other public place for these three years. She is to have neither greenhouse, theatre, or phaeton, to be contented with one maid with, without an additional footman. It engrossed the whole evening to settle these affairs. Mr. W. supped with us and did not go till twelve. As soon as he was gone, Mary exclaimed, Thank heaven, he's off at last. How I do hate him. It was in vain that Mamma represented to her the impropriety she was guilty of in disliking him who was to be her husband, for she persisted in declaring her aversion to him, and hoping she might never see him again. What a wedding this will be. And you, my dear Anne, your faithfully, sincere, Georgiana Stanhope. Dear Anne, Mary, eager to have everyone know of her approaching wedding, and more particularly desirous of triumphing, as she called it, over the Duttons, desired us to walk with her this morning to Stoneham. As we had nothing else to do, we readily agreed and had as pleasant a walk as we could have with Mary, whose conversation entirely consisted in abusing the man she is so soon to marry, and in longing for a blue chaise spotted with silver. When we reached the Duttons, we found the two girls in the dressing room with a very handsome young man, who was, of course, introduced to us. He is the son of Sir Henry Brudnell of Leicestershire. Mr. Brudnell is the handsomest man I ever saw in my life. We are all three very much pleased with him. Mary, who from the moment of our reaching the dressing room had been swelling with the knowledge of her own importance and with a desire of making it known, could not remain long silent on the subject after we were seated, and soon addressing herself to Kitty said, don't you think it will be necessary to have all the jewels new set? Necessary for what? For what? Why, for my appearance? I beg your pardon, but I really do not understand you. What jewels do you speak of, and where is your appearance to be made? At the next ball, to be sure, after I am married. You may imagine their surprise. They were at first incredulous, but on our joining in the story, they at last believed it. And who is it to? was, of course, the first question. Mary pretended bashfulness and answered in confusion, her eyes cast down. To Mr. Watts. This also required confirmation from us, for that anyone who had the beauty and fortune, though small yet a provision, of Mary would willingly marry Mr. Watts could be then scarcely be credited. The subject being now fairly introduced, and she found herself the object of everyone's attention in company, she lost all her confusion and became perfectly unreserved and communicative. I wonder you should never have heard of it before, for in general, things of this nature are very well known in the neighbourhood. I assure you, said Jemima, I never had the least suspicion of such an affair. Has it been in agitation long? 
Oh, yes, ever since Wednesday. They all smiled, particularly Mr. Brudnell. You must know, Mr. Watts is very much in love with me, so that it is quite a match of affection on his side. Not on his only, I suppose, said Kitty. Oh, when there is so much love on one side, there is no occasion for it on the other. However, I do not much dislike him, though he is very plain, to be sure. Mr. Brudnell stared, and Miss Duttons laughed. And Sophie and I were heartily ashamed of our sister, she went on. We are to have a new post-chase, and very likely may set up our fate on. This we knew to be false, but the poor girl was pleased at the idea of persuading the company that such a thing was to be, and I would not deprive her of so harmless an enjoyment, she continued. Mr. Watts is to present me with the family jewels, which I fancy are very considerable. I could not help whispering to Sophie, I fancy not. These jewels are what I suppose must be new set before they can be worn. I shall not wear them till the first ball I go to you after my marriage. If Mrs. Dutton should not go to it, I hope you will let me chaperone you. I shall certainly take Sophie and Georgiana. You are very good, said Kitty, and since you are inclined to undertake the care of young ladies, I should advise you prevail on Mrs. Edgecombe to let you chaperone her six daughters, which with your two sisters and ourselves will make your entree very respectable. Kitty made us all smile, except Mary, who did not understand her meaning, and coolly said that she should not like to chaperone so many. Sophie and I now endeavoured to change the conversation, but succeeded only for a few minutes, for Mary took care to bring back their attention to her, and her approaching wedding. I was sorry for my sister's sake to see that Mr. Brudnell seemed to take pleasure in listening to her account of it, and even encouraged her by his questions and remarks, for it was evident that his only aim was to laugh at her. I am afraid he found her very ridiculous. He kept his countenance extremely well, yet it was easy to see that it was with difficulty he kept it. At length, however, he seemed fatigued and disgusted with her ridiculous conversation, as he turned from her to us, and spoke but little to her for about half an hour before we left Stoneham. As soon as we were out of the house, we all joined in praising the, the person and manners of Mr. Brudnell. We found Mr. Watts at home. So, Miss Stanhope, said he, you see I am come a-courting, in a true lover-like manner. Well, you need not have told me that. I knew why you came very well. Sophie and I then left the room, imagining, of course, that we must be in the way if a scene of courtship could begin. We were surprised at being followed almost immediately by Mary. And is your courting so soon over? said Sophie. Courting, replied Mary. We have been quarrelling. What's this such a fool? I hope I shall never see him again. I am afraid you will, said I, as he dines here today. But what has been your dispute? Why, only because I told him that I had seen a man much handsomer than he was this morning. He flew into a great passion and called me a vixen, so I only stayed to tell him I thought him a blackguard and came away. Short and sweet, said Sophie, but pray, Mary, how will this be made up? He ought to ask my pardon, but if he did, I would not forgive him. His submission, then, would not be very useful. When we were dressed, we returned to the parlour where Mamma and Mr. Watts were in close conversation. It seems that he has been complaining to her of her daughter's behaviour, and she has persuaded him to think no more of it. He therefore met Mary with all his accustomed civility, and except one touch at the phaeton and another at the greenhouse, the evening went off with great harmony and cordiality. Watts is going to town to fasten the preparations for the wedding. I am your affectionate friend, Georgiana Stanhope. I wanted to know whether you felt any sympathy for Mary because she's sort of trapped in this situation where if she doesn't marry Mr. Watts, Mr. Watts, <laughs> thank you, he's probably going to marry one of her sisters and she wants to be the first because that gives her some social clout, if you will. She'll be able to escort them around, etc. So were you annoyed by her or did you feel like, I understand where you're coming from? I mean, I kind of understand, but the reasons that she stated were definitely the wrong ones. Yeah. What, for marrying him? She said she wanted to marry him basically despite her sisters and because it would bring her fortune and status. And But then why is he asking to marry her? He's not any better. Like, he's basically treating all of the women, Mr. Watts is basically treating all of the women's story as objects. It doesn't matter who he marries, as long as he marries one of them. 
That line. No, I, I agree. That line where he says, oh, I don't really care which one of you I'm marrying is just up to that point. I was willing to give Mr. Watts the benefit of the doubt somewhat, even though he seemed like a bit of a cranky git. <laughs> then he was just yeah. like six of one, half a dozen of the other. <laughs> and there's like those lines, like a woman's place is at home. So while I think we can critique Mary for her attitude, I also think it's worth critiquing his. And I think Austin was probably trying to critique the general societal expectations and roles of men and women at the time in that they're both stereotypical versions of the people she probably would have come across. Yeah, but the fact that he also sucks does not change my point that her opinion is very skewed. Like, if she'd worded it differently and said, you know, I need to marry for these expectations, I don't want to let down my parents or come up with some other reason which kind of is more easily justifiable, then she would earn more of my sympathy than just being like, I can't let my younger sisters marry before me. They would get really cocky and annoy me so much. It was kind of the impression I got. Also, she really wants that carriage with that's blue with silver spots. Which sounds really ugly, honestly. He wants a chocolate Girls. carriage. <laughs> it's got to be higher than the Duttons. Got to remember that. It's very important. I mean, it is the idea, isn't it, of marriage being a business transaction. Yeah, definitely. Like, neither of them are thinking in terms of sentiment. And I don't think that necessarily endears us to either of them. But I also think it is part of the way of things at the time. So critiquing her for not being like, oh, well, I want to fall in love with someone else as a better reason for not marrying him is not necessarily the point. Point is that if she doesn't marry him, one of her sisters will, and then she loses out. And it's weighing that up on what she would gain versus how much she doesn't want to marry him because he's obnoxious. But the thing is, it's written in an epistolary format. So she's explicitly saying these things to someone else. It's not like we're listening to it inside her head, it would be one thing. She's actually just saying these things. My point was that if she just said it in a nicer way, or at least tried to appear like she actually cared about someone other than herself, I might be more sympathetic. Not that it's any ideas about love or anything else. I wasn't even... Yeah, no, I'm not necessarily sympathetic to her reasons. But on the other hand, I get the impression she's very young and quite childlike in the way she writes and in the way she kind of constantly flips between her state of mind on, yeah, I'll do this versus no, I won't do that. Also, she thinks that the guy who's 32 is ancient, so she's clearly a child. I can't remember how old she is, but yeah, she's much younger. Than me. That's why this story gets me going, because I kind of got a thrill when I realised that her sisters were basically pretending, oh yeah, we're definitely we're definitely going to marry him, Mary, so, you know, you've got to do it, because <laughs> they don't want to marry him yeah. either. I didn't, I, I mean, I guess it wasn't a very nice thing to do, but I didn't think that, I, like, I was sort of more sympathetic to um, Georgiana and Sophie. <laughs> I mean, it was still, it was a cruel thing to do, but if Mary was capable of thinking for herself, it wouldn't be a problem. Yeah. And if she had a more genuine reason, I suppose, for refusing him, then spiting her sisters. Like, the reason that their words work is because she was so set on doing it to spite them. Yeah. When when they go off to see the Dussons, she's very, like, she puts her face on it, like, oh, yes, it's wonderful, it's true love, I'm going to get all these jewels, you know? Hmm. I mean, I do sympathise her with her a bit. I don't think she's likable. But at the same time, like, all of the other characters are mocking her and she's not noticing that and I just feel a bit bad for her because she's just clearly not very with it. Like, she comes across as a kind of immature, selfish child. I think this, her character, is a pretty good demonstration of relatability versus likability, where she's not really very likable but we can definitely understand why a person like this would exist and we can see why she would think that way. And because some of it's through her perspective, we kind of, we can walk in her shoes for a bit, which really makes the story work, even though we don't necessarily like her. Mm. Yeah, like if we completely wanted her to get with Mr. Watts, the entire tension of the story would fall away. What if she would or not? Jane Austen is quite, in particular, is quite well known for doing these kind of characters that have a very sort of significant flaw, if you like. So, I mean, Emma is, is one of them. She is she spends a lot of her time trying to get 
Harriet interested in living the kind of life that she has where she's very like a social climber and she kind of pushes her away from the nice um, is he a farmer <laughs> nice farmer man <laughs> so she's quite pushy um and then there's also of course uh Elizabeth and Mr Darcy who um I mean their their flaws are the title of the book <laughs> Pride and Prejudice so <laughs> I guess I wanted to point out that in particular Jane Austen seems very skilled at writing these characters that we like them even though they don't always act in likable ways and I think that's a really impressive thing and it's not always easy to get the right balance between a character that messes up and goes wrong and yet you still are rooting for them on, to get through and win what they want. It's definitely an important skill I think in all kinds of writing because you can't not have a character with flaws because that's what makes them human and therefore interesting and relatable to the reader because we just don't relate to perfect people but also if they're too flawed or flawed in the wrong way I guess we're more likely to be well we don't want them to succeed. Yeah, because the power of, I guess, Pride and Prejudice is that the two characters sort of overcome their flaws, if you like, or mm. um, best them. Well, in this story, that is not the case. <laughs> they fall to them. No. Although, admittedly, this is also a much shorter story. Yeah, I think this story is interesting because of the way that it, it ends with, you know, they, they get married. And... Mm. It does have a lot of parallels to... Pride and Prejudice, and that is similarly a group of sisters and the neighbour next door who's more, I guess, got a reputation for being standoffish despite his wealth. It's interesting. I almost feel like you can tell when Jessie Jane Austen wants us to root for it, though, because she made Darcy handsome versus this guy who she described as repugnant. <laughs> like, he's not your handsome bastard character. He's just coded as being very unattractive. <laughs> yeah. They uh, all of all all three sisters insult the way he looks, and indeed yeah. his, his very character. <laughs> I feel like that's how you can sometimes tell in a romance novel: is are we supposed to root for this guy? Yes, if he's attractive. No, if he's not. I mean, sometimes you got to signal this somehow, right? And it's a very easy way to do that. A big part of the reason why Jane Austen can make these characters who have flaws that work really well, and that we still like the characters is because they're always flaws that are very grounded and believable and they're always things that we can see in ourselves on occasion and i think that's the key part because we can easily see oh sometimes i'm a bit prideful i get too wrapped up in myself and then if you can imagine what that would be like if you exaggerated it a little, a little bit more and made it into a big problem and so part of the reason why those stories work is because you have that key part of the character and you can relate it to yourself and it can teach you something about maybe yourself or how you interact with people. Mm. If you just came up with some other flaw that doesn't really feel real, it just wouldn't work. Yeah, and it's also what gives your story stakes because if your flaw is like, they're really bad at ballroom dancing, but there never comes a point in the story where ballroom dancing has any relevance. It's going to be like, well, that's a bit of a cop out, isn't it? Yeah. The idea that your flaws have to be relevant to the story. In this case, her indecisiveness is a key flaw to her need to make a decision on if she's going to marry this guy or not. Like, if she could make up her mind on her own, half the tension of the plot wouldn't be there. Yeah, I feel like. That's a mistake that new writers make quite a lot is that they say, oh, characters are supposed to have flaws and then you just come up with something random. Mm. It doesn't really fit the story. Like, it's important that the character and the plot fit together, right? Yeah. A change in a character is going to change your plot, a change in a plot is going to change your character. If you have something in one that doesn't affect the other, then it just doesn't fit. Yeah, and don't get me wrong, you can have a character who's terrible at ballroom dancing and never have a ballroom dance come up but that can't then be their only flaw. It can just be like another random little detail to give them 3D flesh and colour, as opposed to the one thing you're hanging their non-perfectiveness on. Yeah. So I guess the way Jane Austen is skilled is that she makes characters with flaws that are believable in the societies that they are living in and the cultures that they mm. live in. Yes, and which often reflect upon the cultures and society they're living in as well. 
like the whole being flaw um being swayed by society thing is very much it feels a product of the time she's writing with and such the strong force of expectations even things like mr darcy um breaks up the relationship between his friend and elizabeth's sister because he that he has a little bit of backstory where he knows that other girls have gone after his friend before and not necessarily had the best of intentions even building mm. things like that really is really helpful to explain why you know they're acting in this maybe not very nice way or... mm. it's also worth noting that a lot of flaws can also be um attractive qualities in a character example you just gave of darcy it's loyalty is the trait there at the core of what his behavior is and it's kind of i guess the idea that on one hand loyalty is a very positive trait to have but on the other hand taken too far or to an extreme in the opposite direction the same positive quality of being very honest or and loyal and proactive when it comes to defending your friends is also going to end up as a flaw in your character and could go badly he just ends up being stubborn right yeah Mary in this one, thinking about her societal position, isn't necessarily in itself a flaw, because I think to a certain extent, if she was completely blind to what society demanded of women, that would also be a flaw within the concept of story and need for foolishness. Basically, Mar- uh, Mary is another example of someone whose flaw could be positive if the story spun a different way. It's not completely one or the other where you can neatly write a list of flaws and a list of positive qualities without them ever interacting with each other. Yeah, the best flaws are often just the flip side of characters' positive yeah. traits. Does every character have to have a flaw? I would think so, yes. Are you, do you mean main characters or side characters? I mean, to a certain extent, it depends on how much they're in the story. But I think the more page time you give a character, the more they need to have a flaw. I think there's a place for characters that don't have flaws. Bear with me on this one, but I would argue that Superman does not have a flaw. He has a weakness, but that's different. As a character, he is mostly perfect. Example of flaws that aren't really flaws, like, oh my god, this hero cares so much about people, they'll recklessly put themselves in danger to help people. Like, to a certain extent, that's a flaw that can be exploited, but we all know it's not really a flaw to care a bit too much about the good of innocent people. Right. I think there is a, a kind of character where they don't have any noticeable flaws and they get away with it because they're that certain kind of character who doesn't really need to change. They are good at what they do and they show up and they do it. And the driving force of change in that kind of story is it's often around them. It either comes from other characters or the setting. But they themselves are constant. And I think in that situation, you don't need a Possibly. Flaw. They're the standstill character arc where, as a character, they promote change, or the character arcs of other characters around them, or they're tackling some injustice in the society. And therefore, the point of the perfect character is to reveal the lie in society rather than the lie within the character itself. Yeah. So I, I would say, like, so many things in writing, there are no absolute. And there is a place for a character that has no flaws. You just have to be aware of what you're doing. I've heard it called a static character before as well. They seem to turn up in more like sort of episodic or series. Oh yeah, yeah, I've heard of it. It's a flat character arc. But that said, for the most part, I do even I do think a character with some form of flaw is still more interesting than the character in a flat arc. Like for me, Superman, even though he's perfect, is not that interesting, personally. But that'll always be a subjective reader thing. No, I, I see your point. But I also think there's another case where you have a character who perhaps has flaws, but they're never shown, who is perhaps a side character, or someone who exists to affect change in someone else. It, yeah. it doesn't have to be someone like Superman. It can just be someone that they like, or they have some other purpose in the story. Mm-hmm. And you don't necessarily need to show what their flaw is, or even if they have one. Fair, but I also think your characters will always feel slightly less developed if you don't give them a flaw. I think it can work for the purposes of stories, but then those characters become more symbolic than real. Like, don't get me wrong, it can work. It's just, they're never going to be the characters that I take to my heart. Character flaws are often used to make readers empathise with the character. Are there any other things you need to bear in mind when doing this that we haven't? Discuss. Make sure to also give them attractive qualities. I think a lot of writing 
advice for good reason um, is focused on make sure you give your characters flaws. But I think the flip side of that is that some new writers can forget to also give their characters the attractive qualities. So they focus so much on like, they are insecure and not good at this and don't give them enough endearing qualities to balance out from that. I think that the characters in this story have enough positive traits. I'm not sure they do. Mary certainly, I don't think, does. Like, there's the idea, isn't there, of, like, save the puppy or whatever I think it might be called, or save the cat or something where you show a character, establish a character doing something good early on to kind of show that they are essentially a good character at heart. Mary never has that. Like, there's not one point where she feels slightly bad about her actions. Same with Mr. Watt. Like, her, I guess her sisters are a little bit sympathetic and have some attractive qualities, but for the most part. Her sisters are very good at trolling Mary, and that makes me like them. Yes. <laughs> that wasn't very eloquently put, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, it was perfect. I think in many ways, Mary is deliberately kind of unsympathetic in this story, because we kind of want her to get what she deserves, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jane Austen isn't really using the Mary's flaw to make us like her. He's doing it to make us hate her, right? Yeah. yeah. And by extension, seeing her younger sisters prey on her weakness without her knowing is immensely satisfying. And therefore, it builds empathy towards them. Yes. But it's only satisfying because she's been so cruel to her sisters, I suppose, or so utterly uncaring. That's why the more I thought about this story, the more mean I felt, because I was like, yeah, I want her sister to come out on top. And then I'm like, poor Mary, she has to marry this really old guy. And I'm like, yeah, but... She doesn't have to. It's literally her <laughs> choice. That's the point. <laughs> like, it'd be one thing if she was being forced into the marriage. Well, we were getting, you know, back scenes of Mr. Watt treating her terribly. But at this point, it's like very much a case of she could refuse him. She could, but then one of her sisters would have to marry him, and I would rather have Mary marry him. Would they actually, do you think? I don't know. Well, the mother says that if um, Mary or Georgiana won't have him, then Sophie must, whatever that means. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that means. The mother is clearly the true villain of this piece. She raised Mary to be half she is. <laughs> <laughs> so I, perhaps the floor is, is more to gain sympathy in, in the younger sisters then, because they are schemers, then perhaps not nice people. But we root for them anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's, that is, again, because it's so believable that they would feel this way towards someone like Mary, right? We can kind of understand it. And although we, we might not go so far as to try and trick Mary in the way that, that they did, we, we can see why they would, and, and we kind of respect it, even though it's not very nice. We might even recognise someone a bit like Mary in our own lives, maybe. Yeah. I don't think all characters have to be nice either, though. Like, to have a completely nice character, I think, can be irritating. Because we do want those cathartic feelings, or sometimes we want vengeance. But being not nice is a flaw. I mean, not really, actually. It's like it's not like you're either kind or you're cruel. You can have a character that's in between. Which is kind of where I feel Mary's sisters sit. Because they're not completely horrible. I mean... It is kind of mean to try and trick your sister into marrying someone you know is terrible and will make her unhappy. Yes, but it's still within Mary's control to say no. It's not like they're scheming and she realises with horror that she's trapped in this relationship that she doesn't want. And her sisters are there cackling going, ha ha, now you have to marry him. (laughs) You also know that if she doesn't, then one of them will. And that helps, helps you with the sympathy as well, because... yeah. You don't. You, you like them more, so you you want Mary to be the one to suffer. <laughs> yeah, it's more lesser of two evils than delighting in them being wicked. Yeah, so Mary gets the choice; they don't. So, would you say that an antagonist is always defined by their flaws, or do you think it's more that they are defined by their opposition to the main character? I think it depends on if you want them to be likable or not. That the basic definition of an antagonist is a character who's opposed to the protagonist and is an obstacle to their goal, so which doesn't actually come with any inherent flaws attached or negative qualities attached. 
Like, you can be a perfectly nice person and still be competing with your main protagonist. However, if you want to write a villainous character, I think you need the flaws. Because that's what's the defining line, almost to a certain extent, between your heroic figure versus your villainous figure. Yeah. What I find interesting is um, negative character arcs where the character becomes overwhelmed by a flaw and they kind of end up the villain of the piece. I always think that's fun. I guess the obvious is Merlin. Yeah. <laughs> Morgana is a good example. Um, I'm thinking Merlin, actually. You were thinking Merlin? I think the character of Merlin undergoes a negative character arc. He grows more and more uncaring to general consequences and crueler to other magic users throughout the course of the story in his obsession to protect Arthur. Yeah, I didn't think of it like that, but that's probably true. It's been a while. <laughs> yes, it has been a very long time. More examples? Uh, Macbeth? Macbeth would obviously be an obvious one. Anything with a tragedy will often involve a negative character arc, but yeah. also not always. But most often for us to actually care about the tragedy, they need to start off as someone we like to a certain extent, or at least you can root for. I, I think this is part of the reason why um, having good character flaws can build this compelling story arc, because we don't know which way it's going to go. We don't know if they're going to overcome their flaw and triumph, or if the flaw is going to overcome them. I guess what I'm talking about here is not the traditional Achilles heel, where, oh no, his weak point is his heel. If you hit him there... <laughs> like it'll all be over um i'm talking more about um the uh, the character being undone by their flaw i suppose it happens quite a lot in villains but it can also happen in main characters and it will often happen at like maybe before the climax of a story as well when the, you get that moment when all is lost i think those moments work best when it's because a character is stuck with a flaw and they haven't quite overcome it yet or their flaw has kind of come to a head and they don't know what to do with it Yes, and they need to either overcome it or succumb to it. Yeah. So Mary's fatal flaw would be her desire to be above other people in society. At the yes no stage, she could decide to make a reasoned decision based on what she actually wants versus her desire to be on top, but she succumbs to her fatal flaw because she doesn't. And it affects the story versus a flaw which would have less of a make or break on the story. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. You can find all of our stories and previous episodes on our website at shortstoryworkshop.com. If you'd like to contact us, you can do so via Twitter. I am at Matt B. Writer. And now... At Pickaholic. And Simone. The underscore M underscore typewriter, also known as the modern typewriter. All right. Thanks again for listening, and we'll be back with another story next week. Goodbye. <laughs>